Είναι μεγάλη χαρά και τιμή που έχουμε μαζί μας τον συνάδελφο και φίλο Κλάου Ζάκ Σχόμπα, ο οποίος είναι καθηγητής ε, των media, της επιστήμης των media ή της φιλοσοφίας των media, εν πάση περιπτώσει, η φιλοσοφία των μέσων στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Τιούμπινγκεν. Ε, ο τίτλος του λέγεται Media Studies, με έμφαση... I think with the emphasis on uh, media innovation, something like that, στην καινοτομία των μέσων, κάτι τέτοιο. Βάση περιπτώσει το ενδιαφέρον είναι ότι έχει uh, συνεκδώσει και επιμεληθεί δεκάδες βιβλία για το μέσο της εικόνας και για την εικόνα ως μέσο γενικά για τη θεωρία με τον μέσον με έμφαση στην εικόνα. Θα αναφέρω μόνο ε, ένα που έχει γράψει μαζί με τον Σιρά, που λέγεται «Η καταγωγή των εικόνων», «Origins of Pictures», που έβγαλε το 2013, για την ανθρωπολογία της εικόνας περισσότερο. Ε, ένα παλιότερο του βιβλίο, ε, «Η εικόνα», Πίξερ όμω εικόνα, έτσι, όχι image, ω μέσο επικοινωνία. Το έβγαλε το 2003 και τώρα βρίσκεται ήδη στην τρίτη ανανεωμένη έκδοσή του. Και μ, η έννοια τη εικόνα στην επιστήμη των εικόνων. Οπότε μπορείτε να φανταστείτε ότι αυτά τα θεωρητικά ζητήματα μεταξύ με φιλοσοφία και επιστήμη ενδιαφέρον εδώ. Ήταν παλαιότερα φιλόσοφος και σιγά σιγά, ας πούμε, άρχισε να πραγματεύεται η ιστορία, η ιστορία της τέχνης και ζητήματα επικοινωνιολογίας και άρχισε να τα συνδέει, ας πούμε, κάπως ε, το ένα με το άλλο. Είναι εκδότης, επίσης, πολλά χρόνια του περιοδικού Image στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Τούμπιγγεν. Είναι ανοιχτής πρόσβασης, οπότε σας συστήνω να ρίξετε μια ματιά ή και να υποβάλλετε, ας πούμε, κάποιο κείμενο και με μεγάλη ανυπομονησία ε, περιμένουμε να τον ακούσουμε σήμερα που θα μιλήσει με θέμα ε, πραγματικότητα και ρεαλισμός στην εικόνα ή καστικός ρεαλισμός, reality and pictorial realism. Um, so as not to repeat the introduction in English, I very briefly but cordially welcome you to our series of lectures and um, You have the floor. We are very much looking forward to listening to you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's an honor to be here at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, but much more it's really a pleasure. And I was already looking forward to being here again. So thank you very much to Leah and, and Vangelis for making this possible and inviting me to your place. Okay, so I am having um, a presentation. Partly the slides are full of stuff to give you more an overall picture, but I won't discuss all the details. So you shouldn't concentrate that much on the slides. So you might do this later. I will focus in my talk on the main line of argument. And this is actually, if you'd put it really short, I would like to inspire you to have a critical um, thinking on photography. And it's not meant photography in an artistic sense, so I'm not that much as an art art history is something different and it's very special. So I don't want to say anything about art, but mainly about pictures in a more political or journalistic uh, sense. So and there you of course might have the expectation that they are in a certain sense true or realistic. So and I would like to, to say something about how you might understand that claim of being realistic in case of pictures, maybe in general, but in particular in case of photography. 
So, um, how do I operate this? Um, yes. Ah, okay. Just very brief and, and comment on my background. So I can consider myself being a philosopher or being a media philosopher. And that means in my understanding that I'm mainly concerned, concerned with conceptual clarification. So and half of the stuff I'm now going to tell you is that kind of thing. So it's the question, how should we understand certain expressions? And yeah, I did this um, in several works uh, on picture theory. And lately I started also to think about the relation to politics since all the world seemed to go crazy. And I thought, how can I somehow contribute to that situation and the first idea was of course uh, thinking about how pictures relate um, in that situation let's think about the fake news debate and stuff like that and so that's an attempt here to show you a little bit of that work um, why you should be careful with pictures mm. so my claim would be they are actually almost never really uh, authentic in a certain sense and it's very difficult to have realistic uh, pictures or one has to think about what this actually means and that it's is what I'm going to do and here's the the plan of my my talk so the first part will be mainly clarifying the concepts reality and realism. And these are quite difficult concepts. And then I will say something about pictorial realism. So about the claim, what is meant by, uh, by the claim that a picture is in a certain sense realistic. What is meant by that? And there are finally some very short comments about ethics. So saying that how we use pictures is actually a, mo a, moral, uh, a moral question and not just an epistemological question. So let's start with the fundamental clarifications, uh, reality. The term reality is very difficult, of course, and for my uh, talk, it's important to distinguish two meanings of reality. So the first meaning is, what is the case, as Wittgenstein once said, you know, the world is everything, what is the case? And what is meant is, what is, uh, what really exists independently of someone, of humans observing that. You know, so Reality is all the stuff independently existing of humans or of subjects. That's the one meaning of reality, but there's another meaning. And in German, we have actually two words to distinguish that. We have reality and Realität, but we only have the word Wirklichkeit, which is somehow meaning what is affecting us. And therefore, we can say in German, Wirklichkeiten, in denen wir leben, which Bloomberg is a famous uh, book title. So realities in that we live, meaning that there are certain kinds of uh, subjective realities. So meaning that you can have a certain understanding of reality or a certain feeling of reality in the sense that's exactly that what you what you are affected by or what you, you experience in a certain. So that is meant like experience reality, one might say, in a short uh, way. And if you have these two meanings of the term reality, then you can define realism as the claim that 
the reality in the second sense is somehow very clear or can be clearly mapped to the reality in the first sense. And so that would be the first claim, very important. So a realist would say the world is actually the way I perceive it. Hmm? And there isn't any other world somehow behind that. Hmm? The, I mean, we might be, we might uh, mistake something for something else, of course. You know? And there are special cases, let's say emotions. You know? So if you're happy, you perceive the world differently um, in comparison when you are sad, of course. Mm. But normally we know about that. If you, if you drink um, too much alcohol, for example, you tend to see uh, one figure as two figures. No, but you can explain this. No, since you have two eyes, the system just get mixed up and then the uh, coordination of the two eyes is no longer working properly. So we, we can explain those things. So it's not meant realism in the naive sense no, that just what we see is the reality. You, you, must, you must keep room for, for adjusting this. No? And we also know, of course, that there is a certain mechanism in our perceptual system, let's say, that we see colors. No, colors are not in that sense real. Uh, since there is a certain process making, uh, generating colors, but they are wavelength in, in the world. Uh. So there is a certain difference, of course, between our perceptual world and the reality as such. But the realist would claim as long as we can explain that difference and as long as we can map those two aspects, then so we should claim that it's that way, that we can do this. No? And so reality is more or less what we perceive in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. Whereas an idealist would say, no, no, there's something very different. You know, the reality are ideas or whatever. There might be souls and God and, and there are lots of things, uh, angels, or you can't see that, but that's the real reality someone else might claim. So I would consider myself as a realist. I would say, no, the reality is exactly what you see with the constrictions are just restrictions are just mentioned. So actually, if you look at that in history, reality is a very difficult concept. And you, you can you realize that they have lots of different ideas on reality throughout history. And what I just explained is actually was created in the modern area, let's say in the 18th century. And it's very much linked to the so-called epistemological turn. So that people were, became aware that there's the main difference between subject and object. And so realism is then defined as something which is, uh, which is the, which exists independently of the subject. But people in ancient times would have conceived this totally different. And later, in, after the linguistic term, one might even again see that differently. So I concentrate now on, on that idea um, that uh, realism is meant in an epistemological sense so that perception and reality is somehow linked. Even if you concentrate on that idea, on that concept of reality, there are of course very uh, different phenomena of uh, realism. And so what I explained up to now is an epistemological realism, meaning that you then ask how is our perception linked to reality as such. And it's a totally different game if you ask how, is, how are representations, in what sense are representations meant to be realistic. Uh, so there is the relation between, let's say, picture and reality or, or description and reality. This is a totally different relation 
than the one between perception and reality. So I call that representational realism, and there are different questions to ask here. So that should be distinguished, I think. And what I'm going to talk then about photo photography is, of course, meant in that sense. It's a realism, for example, in art history or in literature. It's about all the representations. It's not in that epistemological sense. You have finally, which also created in the modern area, so 18th century, the idea that once you accept that there is some representational realism, that you might have the moral obligation to depict or to describe something realistically. This actually in the 18th century, people didn't do that and didn't, people didn't think that it's a proper way to do, since they thought we should depict or we should describe ideals. And we should show people how it should be in order then to make them able to, to reach the ideal. But this totally changed throughout the 19th century and that's therefore the main time which we call the re realistic in literature, for example, where people started to think, no, showing the world in that idealistic view it's a kind of ideology, and since the world isn't that way, and the people are not that way how they are shown in the ideal way, we should, we should look at, it, at the world how it is. And we should be realistic, also in our political claims, of course. So that changed in the 19th century, and that is meant by an ethical realism. So it's not uh, about an uh, epistemological question, but it's about how you should depict something. And in media, of course, um, one has the very strong claim it should be realistic. People should be informed about things, how they are. And it, that's very clear. And, and it's linked, of course, to the concept of politics and public spheres and so on. So let's have a little bit uh, further a look at that ethical principle. So it's created in the Enlightenment and is meant, um, well actually I told you about that slide already so <laughs> I can skip that slide um, and go just on. What you can infer from what I have told you up, by the way, you can interrupt me of course, and um, so I tr just try to go very clearly to the chain of thought. Um, what you can get out of what I told you up to now is that realism is a relation. So this is also very important. So there's certainly not a certain criteria where you really can decide for all times that is realism because at the first, uh, uh, point, the first point is that you have always two relata, relata but that might be very different relata. And so in the epistemological uh, case, the relata are perception and reality. You know? But in the representational case, the relata of course, representation and reality. And if you discuss um, representational realism, then of course you can't talk about, so you wouldn't say in a realistic novel, for example, that the persons described in that novel exist in that literary sense. Now, that would be nonsense. Hmm? Art as such is not about reality in that literal sense. Hmm? So you would say, no, it's the structure which makes a novel, let's say, realistic. So the relata are different. Hmm? So it's on the one hand the representation, the novel or the painting or whatever, but on the other hand, what is depicted or related 
is the structure of, of the reality of, of the society. So it's something more vague in a certain sense. And therefore, you have lots of realism. Now you have, uh, um, I think there might be a slide where I um, comment on that. So therefore, you might have a magical realism, you might have a socialistic realism, and all kinds of realism, depending on what the other relata is you compare the representation with. So that if you see it as a relation realism, that makes you understand why there are so different kinds of realism. And of course, everybody has uh, own choice what the relata are. And not only the relata, but you can also say well, we all refer to a certain structure of society, but the way we explain the, um, that the representation actually maps whatever is on the other side, you can explain this differently. You might have different uh, mechanism to explain what makes a certain representation mapping a certain other uh, structure or thing. So that makes it so difficult, uh, difficult in the sense that everybody has his own realism in a certain sense, or might have. No? <coughs> so one implication of that is that um, what is meant by realism is um, depends heavily on what is considered as a rational construction from the representation to the reality and what are considered as the relata. You might have different relata, you might assume that they're different, important, and thus um, different, um, re different realism appear at different times and in different cultures. So this is very clear. So you can't say this is really realistic. What is to us realistic, and we might agree, look at that picture, that's really realistic. It's, it's whatever you mean by realistic, but I feel that's really, it's even more realistic than whatever I have seen. 10 years later that it will change. It will even change in your own um, perception you know, since all the standards uh, are changing. Okay, <coughs> so that was the first step, conceptual clarification, giving you um, some ideas how the terms reality and re realism should be understand, understood. You know. Should be understood meaning there is not a, a truth in a certain sense how concepts should be used. No? A conceptual clarification is about, is about the question, how should I use a certain term? No? It's not an empiric question. You can't say a certain um, explication of a term is true. That would be nonsense. It, only empirical statements can be true. So this is just how you should think about a certain topic and the evaluation, whether that is good or not, whether it's helpful or not, it's, let's, it's finally the question, is it fruitful to help you to understand the world? So it's not about truth, it's about orientation in my understanding. So let's go one step further. What, this was a general introduction to realism, and now I will turn to pictorial realism. So how is all what I, um, what I said, how can this apply also to pictures in particular? And I would say it's mainly, you can mainly apply everything what I've said up to now also to pictures. And pictures in a broader sense anyway, for example, the history of painting, 
you have all kinds of fictional scenes and that's not that different from from literature I would say but there's a special case namely photography where the claim is that it's more objective than just painting right? and even in the history when photography was invented some of them claim that it's something nature itself is doing. And photography, I think, as a pencil of nature was one of the uh, formulations. And this is certainly false, I would say. I mean, th there it's partly, or it's always difficult if it's partly uh, true that makes it so difficult to understand the whole thing uh, since you then um, might tend to think the whole thing is true but it's only very in a very uh, limited sense true and so that's in my second part what I'm trying now to to show you that you should be very skeptical even about uh, photography it's realistic in a very um, in a very yeah in, not in that direct sense one might think photography is realistic it um, it depends also in the case of photography on various um, yeah various hints on various clues so uh, photography makes the impression of being realistic but it's not realistic I would say so to understand well this sounds very strange of course to understand that I will um, go a little um, in a little different direction but it, I think it's helpful to understand that so I would like to say something about documentaries be because it's easier to understand in the course case of documentaries and then I'm coming back to photography and hopefully it's then better uh, understandable so documentaries as you all know there are two faces of course on the one hand there is a, a strong link to, to a photographic um, image but even the first documentary and I think Nanook of the North is considered the first one and if you look at that documentary you see that there is lots of stuff not really uh, not the reality you know, so they changed the name of the actor the actor um, yeah there was a woman but it was actually not his wife but in the film it's supposed to be his wife and and so on and, this is, and he had right he he had um, still a spear but they had already guns so the picture the reality was really different you know? but it was considered and maybe in a yeah it's okay that it was considered as a documentary you know? so that shows in a certain sense all documentaries are um, yeah, staged in a certain you have to do that I mean if you have a documentary about uh, different culture different time you anyway I mean all the people are, don are gone they're dead I mean you, you can't have them in front of the camera you, you must need you, you must use actors now, in that sense every film is of course um, on stage and it's, um, it's not the reality as such and therefore if you uh, think about doc documentaries you would say that what makes a film a documentary is that mainly the claim to be truthful in a certain sense truthful huh? so not meaning that really the particular persons 
uh, persons in that environment. Now, you might use actors and nevertheless say it's a documentary. So it's not about like novels. It's not in that sense realistic, uh, uh, a documentary in a realistic sense that really every person or every single uh, object is depicted um, from the world, but it's that you have, well, the overall picture is meant to be realistic. Mm. So um, you have, if you want to be successful with the documentary, you have to, to make it sure, you, maf you have to make um, it understandable that it's really documentary, and therefore you use certain clues of authenticity. Mm. And in TV, it's very important. For example, if you have someone in front of the camera without all the color in the face and so, it doesn't look realistic. So you have to make it very unrealistic in order to have the impression of uh, being realistic. So authenticity is here in relation to, to representational realism is very strange concept. Now, it's something you must evoke in the um, observer. Now, it's not something the representation as such is having in a certain sense, now, but you create the feeling of authenticity. And you do this in a certain sense to make understandable, okay, it's a documentary, you shouldn't take it too literally, and so on. And this, so it's a highly uh, complex process. And of course, since everything is staged, um, you never know whether it's used differently. You, know, you can use this way and that way. And I mean, how do you know? I mean, we certainly don't know. No? I mean, you can trust someone. You say, okay, that's a nice guy. So is authenticity the kind of relation, the, the credible relation between the representation and the reality that it's supposed to? I'm just trying to... Yeah, it's the, it's the cue. It's a an, an property of the representation, but not in that sense that it's guaranteeing but it's just somehow claiming. It's making the impression. So therefore, I think we all have that uh, reality TV show, which are, of course, not at all about reality, but just trying to get the impression of reality. And I guess, since all the people have problems with their authenticity, they are keen to at least to watch it. If they don't have it, they won't at least watch it. But what they get is, of course, not. It's, uh, it's just the, it's fake in a certain sense. No? But it's the impression of, re of reality. No? So authenticity is a promise which is never, uh, in a certain sense, uh, given. No? It's a false promise, I would say. So if something looks really authentic, you should be careful. It's somehow dangerous. Mm. So that's um, the claim. So I think it's in case of documentaries more clear that you have any way to stage um, all the scenes. And it's not in that sense realistic that you really get the reality as it is. So we need that science. Um, that is a certain sign game, we might say, documentaries. And we are able to play it, of course. No? But it's a credit we give to, to certain directors. So we think, okay, this is a nice guy, we know, we, he's doing something else, and, and we trust him. But that's it. I mean, it's not the film as such which makes it, uh, which gives the proof. Hmm? It's the person we trust which makes us believe that what the film is showing us is the case. So that would be a little bit provocative 
claim about documentaries. And now I'm turning, as I said, to uh, back to photography. And my claim is photography is as such a very problematic uh, yeah, medium, a very problematic representation, because it makes us think that the world is like the photography depicts it, but that's false, you know? false claim, false promise, you know? very dangerous, I would say. And that's the reason why all the people engage photography, since all the people have some interest in, in changing people's mind and so. And you can do this with photography, of course, very good, because, uh, very well, because photography has the tendency um, to be believed. Mm -hmm. And I'm going now to, to explain this a little bit more. So, in terms of um, sem certain semiotical terms, you certainly would say photography is an indexical sign, meaning that there's a certain natural process leading to what a photograph is. So there's light, there's a certain paper sensitive to light, and so this is a natural process. Now this is, and of course, otherwise we wouldn't go to the dentist and believe there's also kinds of photographies. Now in a certain sense, it's true. There, there is an index, indexical uh, line, so a causal relation between the photography and the world. This is certainly true. And this makes the whole thing so dangerous. No? Because this is true, certainly, but the, um, it's only true if you very well know how the photography is created. Now, for example, if, if a dentist is using his pictures, I mean, you couldn't do that. Then you, that have to be learned, and you must, of course, uh, know a lot of how those um, pictures are created. So that's a kind of uh, a controlled process. You must know a lot about that um, process in order to interpret those pictures uh, properly. But normally, if we um, look at an uh, photography, if we observe it, if we interpret it, we are not really interested in the causal chain. I mean, we assume it in the background, but how we actually perceive the photography is like any painting. So we take it, we didn't take it in that uh, case as an indexical sign, but as an iconic sign. And so we take it just as a picture. And a picture is very different from an indexical sign, since as a picture, we interpret it according to resemblance, for example. And so we recognize a certain structure, and we assume that the picture is about what the picture resembles. But that's different from the causal relation. That might not be the case. So we assume that the causal relation is what guarantees uh, the picture to be truthful, but when we interpret the picture, we use it just as an iconic sign. And then we, as Peirce, for example, uh, says that the difference between the different types of, of sign is the how we interpret those. No? So we do not interpret in case of um, in as we we do not follow the causal chain to interpret the picture. The, the dentist might do this or should do it. I would say um, very painful if he's not doing it properly. Um, but the normal person don't care about the, the causal chain. He just takes it as an iconic sign and takes the causal chain just as some kind of proof that whatever he's recognizing in the photography is the case. 
And so that makes it so. So this is one reason why photography is um, somehow dangerous. And a second reason, and one might add various reasons now, a second reason is very clear that you can, yeah, at f um, obviously you can edit photography, of course, and you could do this all the time. It's not only digital photography where you can change whatever you want. No, it's, it's all the time. It's already, if you choose a certain object, already that is some kind of uh, staging. Right? But you might choose a different object. No? If you have a picture of the uh, politicians at UE, they're always standing, smiling happily, shaking hands. I mean, is that the reality? In what sense is that the reality? I mean, they are, of course, taking a certain part of the world and uh, trying to convince you that that is the important part or so. And, uh, saying, well, it's not the whole world, but that's what uh, now at the moment is important. So take it as a whole world. Uh, and so you can, even with selecting different objects, change the interpretation of a photography. Uh, and you have all kinds. You can use lighting, you can use perspective. There are lots of um, um, also empirical studies how perspective, for example, is changing the interpretation. It is different whether you have a photography looking from above or from below. It, it gives you a certain different evaluation of the object you, um, you see in the photography. So lots of things, and of course you can, if you have then the, the picture, you can change in the picture. So that is all how you can change the object, the way you look at the object, but you can change the picture as, for example, in the, uh, you can um, have a certain degrees of sharpness, and, and this matters also, and it gives you a different impression. Uh, lots of um, um, yeah, means to, to change the photography, and therefore, the difference is not that uh, much to paint to a painting, I would say. Uh, and that's, of course, the reason why we have also uh, art photography and a history of art photography. Uh, that wouldn't be possible if it's just uh, giving you the reality, of course. Uh. Roland Bart, by the way, if you, I like that guy and his work very much. He's saying more or less what I'm trying to explain. In, there's one, um, one article, and he's using that uh, paradox of photography. I, I don't know whether the article is. I think it's, rhetor it's uh, rhetoric of picture, oh, I don't know exactly the title, but he has nice um, works and very um, helpful if you want to have a deeper look into that. So, um, photography, how much time is left? It's okay, don't think about it. Okay, I can do it very, I can just summarize in two minutes all the rest if you ask me to do that. So maybe, at, um, yeah, sh it's maybe helpful to, to give some uh, t theoretical reason why it's working that way, now why you can have a photography and why you can use it in an ideological way. Now, why is it that you can have a picture which is considered as realistic normally, and why can it be used in the totally different direction to create a very a mess in, in somebody's mind and, and change attitudes and whatever? Why is that? And one reason you can give on a more theoretical level would be 
you distinguish between different levels of meaning and the main idea is of course if you have what is at the first um, point a content so this is very for pictures in general very special since you can create a naturalistic um, appearance of an object you couldn't do that in that um, well not as good as with a painting and it you can of course have very elaborate descriptions and can also evoke a very a clear picture in a certain sense in your mind of a certain scene but using a picture it's easier and you can have it very realistic that makes somehow pictures special the content, the level of content. And that level is linked to cognitive mechanism, since it's linked to our perceptual system. And there's lots to be said about that. Um, but I won't uh, go into that. But even if you go one step further and consider the reference, so the reference is not what you see in a picture, it's not that lively impression you might have of an object while observing a picture, but it's the concrete object in the world. So it's that what makes a picture realistic. Now the reference, so the, the, um, the picture um, of a certain and the, the picture of a cat so that's the depiction the presentation but the cat the single empirical cat that's the referent of a photography and even in that case you can't be sure there's that famous uh, twin problem so if there are t uh, two twins oh, so there can't be two <laughs> twins only two and uh, and let's assume they are really uh, very similar so that you can't uh, tell them apart. And then you have a photography of the one twin. And how do you know, just taking the photography, whether it's a photography of the one or the other twin? You can't. You can only if you have the causal chain. So if you know where is, we're actually standing there when, the, when someone took the phot photography. Mm -hmm. So there's no other way around. Now, without really controlling the causal chain, you don't know. Now, even the referent is not really clear. And if you have then the symbolic meaning of the communica communicative meaning, it's even more a mess in the case of pictures since they normally do not give you a proper hint what you should do with the picture. There's that famous uh, saying by Wittgenstein, a um, um, picture of a boxer, and Wittgenstein is saying, okay, if you look at the picture, you don't know whether it's meant to show you a certain um, empiric boxer, how he stood in a certain time, or whether it's meant to show you how you should uh, stand before a fight. Or, so the, the locative uh, meaning, you might say, so what is actually meant to provoke in the observer, this is not really clear in case of peer. Normally you have a context and you, in a certain sense, um, they can make it understandable, the one who uses pictures, but it's not understandable from the picture itself. So that would be the claim. In case of language, you have all the kinds of, um, you, you can explain what you are doing, you, you, you have gestures and so language if you talk to someone it's of course much richer and there are all kinds of clues to understand whether someone is asking you for someone or whether it's um, just informing you and in case of language it's much more easy to to understand but in the case of picture the context is doing the work so that is saying that is meaning pictures are also special because they're very context sensitive. 
and that's actually the reason why they can be used so ideologically since you can just change the content text and then you change the meaning very easy yeah. so you can even take a photography which is considered as very serious and and uh, well known and so on change the context circulate again and you might have then a totally different meaning you can even have the opposite meaning you can do this actually this is very i mean you should have it as a task and take uh, some photography and the task is okay create the different the opposite meaning and convince someone that it's the opposite you can do that with with pictures i think and particularly the photography you can do this i would say this is strange somehow no? and the reason is um, in my understanding since you have the first level the content which is very special to pictures but you have all the other levels which are context sensitive and therefore you you can um, yeah you, you can easily change in a certain sense the message by changing the context i, I don't go into that it's a little, um, yeah by the way i mean if you'd like to have the um, the presentation i can give it to you and can i ask you something about this can we go to the slides before that <coughs> what would be the difference of one before what would be the difference between the in your case the symbolic and the communicative I mean, okay, so, well, the, yeah, the symbolic meaning, that's something Roland Barthes is, um, is talking about a lot. And if you have an, um, a certain animal, it, it, the picture of an animal is a picture of that animal in an empirical sense, but in animals are main, very often used as symbols for something. Um, a, a pigeon, for example, was used in the medieval times for the Holy Ghost, I think, or Picasso used that. It's from the Bible, of course, no, when the ark, and, and there's then the, the palm um, in, in the, sorry, I don't know, th when, once it comes to the special uh, terminology, I'm very bad. Oh, that's right. I'm hmm. just asking, why isn't the symbolic level the same as the communicative one, the since they both refer to this culturally inscribed uh, content in the image. I mean, so, so, uh, so before, yes. the symbolic level yeah. is what a certain community ascribes to to a certain symbol, a symbol in the mean in meaning. A pigeon, for example, and therefore you might have a dictionary of symbols. You, you okay. actually have that. No? So and the land and the community of meaning is a parole, like Flosch uses analysis of pictures, like the system and a special instance of communication. Is, is uh, this the distinction you're trying to make? Um, well, in, if you read around Bart, it's the um, connotation. connotation Right, no? yeah. so the first two are in charge of denoting something. Yeah. And the second two are in charge of, um, well, mainly the symbolic meaning is the connotation. And Orambat would say it's a second system you put on, on second the first system. one. And the yeah. communicative then is the specific instance of this symbolic use. Kind of right. The, 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 right, the last one is what the speech act uh, theory is saying. Yeah. Okay. So that you use, you might use a picture to inform, to warn someone and so on. And there's also the um, perlocutionary uh, function that is meant what you actually intend to change uh, as the a attitude, uh, what attitude you want to change or how you would like to change the behavior of someone. Enunciation within the speech. Okay. Okay. Now I understand. Okay. I'm asking for the students because we were discussing exactly how uh, Roland Barthes, let's say, misinterpreted helps level. 
in using this distinction of connotation and denotation. Okay. But in that sense also gave rise to an interesting discussion about discourse. What is discourse? What is context every time? Okay. Is it a set of values that the image responds to or is it something enunciated that wants to, as you said, uh, communicate something specific? And I like the fact that you have done this uh, like bipartite distinction mm. and it makes clear that symbol is the more passive side of the communicative act. It's land, it's system. And the communicative meaning is something that we uh, specifically want to position in the communicative environment. Okay. Something like that. I don't know. We, we had this discussion yesterday, actually. So. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I the. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, if you come down to, to those let's say, to the communicative meaning, this is, of course, much more complex. Now, since it's, it, it's the communicative uh, process, and you, you might um, have the conversional maxims, and so that's not that easy uh, to find out. Né? And it's certainly nothing you have in the picture itself. Né? So that comes from the communicative context. Mm -hmm. you, you, can't, you can't have, a, let's say that there are some pictures uh, here on the wall, all the same, there is no woman, you can, but all the guys there. And yeah, wh what is it meant? Is it meant to, to show how good uh, um, male figures are? Or you, you might interpret that way? Or I mean, the communicative meaning is very difficult to find out, and it changes all the you know, time. This is a laboratory for semiotics. Right. Patriarchal. Okay, yeah. and then you, you might, well, okay, these are just uh, the guys happen to be the canon or so. And, but I mean, if you, if, you have, if you don't have that context, you, you, find, you could find very strange interpretations of you know, what, what are. What do they want to tell me, having all that old guys there? White, old, and... <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is just so funny, yeah. <coughs> okay, um, so I'm almost uh, through. So this is now more um, a summary of what I was telling you, um, <coughs> authenticity is the central um, category in, in case of documentaries. This, this was clear. So it's not really um, the reality you get, but you get the impression or you get, so this is claiming to be the reality, but whether you really have it or this is nothing you can decide just by watching a documentary. Finally, you have to go around and have look by yourself how things are. Now you can't, you shouldn't just say, oh, "Well, it's in the film." It's, it's true because it's in the film. No, no, it's not true because it's in the film. You don't know. It's just claiming that it's true, and it has a certain technique to make it understandable, so to make the claim understandable, not the truth value. Mm. And so that's about authenticity. I think that is clear. And in the case, uh, yes? It's still not clear to me, authenticity, because you describe it as a quality belonging to the representation that gives a certain impression. But um, it, doesn't it have to be underwritten by an institution or a person that you trust, that, as opposed to being a quality of the object? Oh, yeah, I mean, okay, there are different meanings also to authenticity. It's a di different, uh, difficult uh, term as well. What I meant is, for example, in documentaries, if, if you have a handheld camera, so that what the, for a certain time, tend to do. 
and saying, okay, the, the camera is, is just shaking. That must be reality, né? since in fiction we don't have that. But of course, that's nonsense. I mean, you can, and then you can do it in fiction as well, and they did it. Né? So these are the clues, and these are properties of the representation, and they change it all the time since they, they, they weaken if you get used to it, and so they need something new to make you feel it authentic. Né? So in, in that sense, I, I meant authenticity in that sense. But there's a different sense, of course, if you, if you have a sign or if you have a certain, certain stamp saying, okay, this is controlled, and that's, you might use it in that sense. So it's authentic, meaning uh, what you buy in, in a store, it's really from that area. And you, I mean, you can, can't be really be sure, of course, that there can be uh, mistakes and people can, and people normally, whatever they can do, they do, I think. But it's also kind of authenticity saying there are some people looked at that and we, we stand with our name for that's really, that you get what you um, ask for. So. So there are different um, meanings. Um, okay, but what I meant is just there are certain properties a representation has um, in order to convince you or to make the claim understandable that it's a documentary, for example. Okay, and, and the same more or less applies to photography. Um, as I said, and um, you shouldn't trust um, a, a photography more than anything, any other picture. And so being a photography is not a proof that it's true what you see. And here's, I won't go into that, but this is an argument where you have it in a different presentation, what I told you. Um, I go very quickly through that. I mean, you might say if you, um, if you look at the picture, you recognize, let's say, a cat in the picture, and that's so easy, that would be the claim, because you know cats and you're perceptual system is very, anyway, our perceptual system is very good. And we can easily distinct cats and dogs and, and all kinds of things. It's very important to do that. Of course, if you go to the street, we must immediately recognize whether there is a car or whether it's standing and moving. So we are very competent perceiver and we can use exactly that module, you might say, so our perceptual system also to interpret pictures. That makes it so easy, or seemingly easy, to interpret pictures. And that creates the, um, the effect that we can understand pictures immediately. And so that's, for example, the reason why some people say uh, there might be a picture language all over the world. Now we have to, to learn uh, spoken language, very difficult, you have to make vocabulary. But in the case of pictures, we might have a language all over the world and everybody's able to understand it. So that's why we more or less have the same perceptual system. That's the idea. But the the, the shortcoming or the danger in pictures is that our perceptual system is of course realistic. No? So whatever we perceive, we assume that it exists and that's good, of course. Now if we cross the street, we shouldn't doubt that the car which is approaching is really there. I mean, you can doubt that in a philosophical seminar, but you shouldn't do this on the street. You know? So in everyday life, we are, of course, realists, and we don't have any doubt, and we 
react immediately to that. So whatever we perceive, we take that it exists. And that's good, so. But in the case of depictions, we somehow inherit that. So we, since we use our perceptual system, right, and there's therefore the tendency, whatever we perceive in a picture, to take as really existing. Right? And we, that's the claim, we do this, although we know that pictures can be false, no? our attitude towards <coughs> for photography, I would claim, hasn't changed, although we know about digital photography and we know that there are old pictures we see, for example, in a newspaper, are digital photographies, I guess. But, so, I mean, th this is not any more that indexical sign we used to think. No? Nevertheless, no, we, still are, we still tend to take whatever we see as real and it shapes our world view and uh, our understanding of ourselves and so on. Mm. So lots of aspects. Now, for example, if you see all the um, fashion photography, I mean, we also tend to think, okay, all the people are so beautiful, just I. <laughs> um, what, what a pity, you know? But y you feel somehow, um, yeah, you th well, actually, nobody looks like that. You know? it's, it's not, it's uh, created. You know? But you tend to think, no, almost everybody looks so beautiful, and, and I feel pity for myself and not being able to match up. And that's just ridiculous, of course. Hmm. Okay, I mean, I think that's it. Thank you for your attention. Hmm. Uh, yeah, Klaus, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Do you have any questions? Uh, Professor Katzkobak uh, will be at your disposal. Yeah. I find it so. I find it difficult to understand it. Maybe I, I come around or no. Yeah. Um. quite sure whether I understood everything properly, but what you're saying is referring to Roland Barthes, and he has that expression that uh, photography in particular is a, is a sign or so without code. And what, but he's actually not really saying that, but he's saying seemingly it doesn't have a code since language is functioning differently. So in case of language, you have a dictionary, you can look it up, there are a grammar, there are rules, how to then interpret a text. You don't have it in that way in the case of um, pictures, and therefore he is saying 
there's no code to, to pictures. And yeah, there's no grammar, that's right. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's of course um, functioning as a communicative act, deli delivering a certain message. The, the difference is that you need more uh, principles from outside. You, know, you don't have the rules um, in, in, in form of a grammar, but you have certain conventions how to handle um, um, pictures. And they then take over and lead you to, to interpreting the, um, the picture. And that's actually what Bart wants to, to say, that pictures are, without having that grammar or whatever, they are very powerful. And since they have that secondary system, the connotation, and the connotation is doing uh, the meaning for ex in a certain sense. No? What you get from, from the pictures is normally the connotation. No? So it's what the picture um, alludes to, you know, what, what is what you somehow, all the associations you have and you can calculate, and that's of course the idea. So if, you, if you're doing an ad or so, you can calculate what association someone has with certain uh, hints or clues. And so that's not an anarchistic process, but you can really uh, determine by, well, of course, otherwise you, you wouldn't use uh, photography in, in ads. And as you can determine what then finally the associations will be in the observer. And, and, and s therefore, Rolambat is saying that uh, photography, photography is a paradox, since on the other, on the one hand, there is no no code, so saying no dictionary in a certain sense, no grammar, but on the other hand, it's very uh, forceful and um, conveying certain meanings. So that makes it paradoxical in the sense of Roland Barthes. But I don't know exactly whether that was the question. Mm. I find it to understand the statement of Barthes because I think that the code exists because it, uh, it's we have it in um, the knowledge of culture in the cognitive process. Many, there are many codes in a uh, Ah, okay. So you're saying there are codes, and you're asking, okay, okay. I, I was trying to understand what, uh, what God means with uh, the meaning of that. Yeah. Because yeah. okay. I think that there are many codes in the cognitive process. Yeah, yeah, okay. I see. No, no, now I understand. I think the, the word code can be understood differently. And if you're a, ah, if you are, uh, no, it's me. If you are saying um, that there are codes, for example, how to use certain animals in a painting, that's of course true. Um, but that's not meant by Roland Barthes. He's talking about a grammar or something like that. So this is like uh, you have, of course, in medieval uh, pictures in particular, all the animals have symbolic meanings. And if you have a garden, for example, and various animals and, and some, there's, I guess, everything determined by that symbolic meaning. So what animals are in the garden? The garden itself is a symbol, and th that's our heritage of um, the Christian um, heritage. No? And they are uh, very, uh, you have symbolic meanings to all kinds of things. No? So in that sense, of course, you have codes. And, and I don't, nobody would deny that. No? But you don't have codes in that sense that you really have a grammar. No, that, uh. So, the 
Okay, I mean, I, I understood that there are already two questions. Um, I mean, the, the one aspect you are saying in case of photography, you, it's not necessary to uh, view it as indexical science. So there's not a causal relation like you have it, for example, um, if an animal or if in the case of fire and smoke, uh, so that there's a clear causal relation. Well, I mean, f for, even if you were right and it's not a clear causal relation, that would of course uh, be even stronger for my uh, overall claim, uh, so that wouldn't be a problem. Um, but nevertheless, I would say no, that would be too strong. So since if, if you have all the um, f kinds of photography in a medical context, there, I mean, you wouldn't go to an operation if you wouldn't trust that causal relation. I mean, there are of course certain aspects in the, photo in the photography no, it's not the phot photography as a whole, but there is one, at least one aspect in a photography or in all those um, um, different ways um, to, to depict, which is based on a causal relation. Otherwise, it wouldn't be usable in a medical context, I would say. 
Sorry, the, the sound is not very clear. I don't know if it's a kind of, because of your relation to the mic. I ah, don't hear okay. you very well. Okay. Um, so I tr tried to make it very short again. So I, I understood already um, there are two questions. The one is the photography is not a good case for a causal relation. And in a certain sense, okay, I would say it's very complex. It's not the simple case like fire and smoke, but at least there must be one aspect which is a causal relation, otherwise it wouldn't be usable in a medical context. So that would be the answer to your first question. And I thought there's a second question saying, well, look, if, there, if photography is both an indexical sign and an iconic sign, how can that be? And there my answer would be, I mean, I'm not an expert on Peirce in a certain sense, although I would say I'm in accordance with Peirce. But I understood Peirce in that way, saying that certain uh, types of signs, certain lexical, iconic, or symbolic signs, they are not determined by the science itself, but you can use one and the same thing as a different type of sign. So you, <coughs> you might have s just a circle, and you can interpret the circle as a number, or as the depiction of the sun, or, and so on. So in my understanding, you can have one and the same object, and what makes the object an iconic sign, or an adexical sign, or whatever, is the way you interpret the object. So whether you use, whether you look for a causal relations, or whether you just look for resemblance, no, or whether you go to the dictionary and just try to um, to have a code for the single so yeah hopefully that did, did you w w was it could you understand it uh, so acoustically uh, can I continue with my second question of, of course do, do you hear me okay yes yes, yes fine okay thank you well, I was very much interested uh, in these components you showed us uh, concerning uh, content, reference, uh, symbolic so, meaning and yeah. communicative meaning. Mm -hmm. So first of all, thank you very much for this clarification that the symbolic meaning is the connotative meaning because it creates a great problem to our colleagues for some reason and they search for symbolism somewhere else than the phonology of meaning. Thank you very much for this clarification. Now, I'm coming to the communication, since you also referred to the term community of meaning. The communication, the communication circuit presupposes, in simple terms, a sender, a text, and a recipient. I would say that your reference Maybe I would prefer personally referential function to come back to the mm -hmm. because this is a function of the text. Mm -hmm. uh, this text, and of course the symbolic meaning, is text. Now, so I will have to do with the text. Now, what is the first component? Content. Uh, you said that. It you wrote, and you said, that has to do with perception and cognition. My first reaction is that it concerns the reader and not the sender. Uh, but this is a question. Now, when we come to the communicative meaning, you said that it's the intended, which means the meaning on the part of the sender. But with the example of the photograph on the wall, you have both cases of the symbolic of the community research. On the one hand, someone puts the photograph on the wall in a certain way and he wants to say something contextually. 
On the other hand, I, or you, or a third person, to read this photograph on the wall. So we, have, we can have a double interpretation. And I try to locate exactly where is the center and where is the receiver. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for, for that question. I mean, that goes now very deep into semiotic, uh, here, in, into the semiotic ocean, one might say, and one has to be careful not to get lost in that ocean. I wouldn't consider me as an expert on, on those, um, yeah, very deep semiotic questions. It's certainly, it's certainly right that um, you have both parts always. There is someone, a sender and a receiver. And that's on all levels. But it's right, when I talked about content, I was more interested in the receiver. Since, um, the, the receiver is the one who creates a certain, um, yeah, who observes a certain scene and, um, yeah, actually I, I'm almost, almost more, more concerned about the conceiver hmm, since, uh, about the receive, receiver, since the effects, for example, if you think about ideology, this is always in, in the part of the receiver. So I want to understand why photography or in general pictures have certain effects. And the effects are, of course, in the um, receiver. But of course, they must be created. Someone must create uh, the photography and someone must maybe uh, have the intention to deceive someone. Uh, yeah, but this is also a very interesting question. I don't want to say this is not a question or not important, but I focus somehow on the uh, perceiver in order to as understand how ideology functions. So that's all. what makes it so successful. So that's just a focus on, on the perceiver or on the receiver in order to better understand it, ideology. I don't want to say that all the other aspects, particularly the producer and, and the sender, that's not important. There must be, of course, uh, someone who created those pictures, and there must be someone also who is responsible for that, no? and who should uh, maybe, yeah, punished for whatever. I mean, th there should be some moral rules, and this applies then, of course, more to the sender, but to the perceiver as well. Um, and one might, for example, ask, well, if then if nobody would watch all the, those horrible uh, videos from the dark net, they wouldn't be produced. No? So in a certain sense, also the receiver is responsible for their doings. No? So, so, but that would then be a totally different uh, discussion. Yeah, I, I'm not sure whether I really could answer your question. I'm sorry, but, but I'm, I would say I'm not really an expert on those um, very deep semiotic questions. But I see that they are very really, uh, difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Well, the 
This question over there. Okay. There are no more questions because I think uh, people are taking some time for all this to sink in. If yeah. She has a question, I oh, think. Oh, yeah. yeah. uh, Thank you about this. Um, Uh, that uh, you see like uh, small disks of uh, light in a picture. If you know the process of uh, how a photography is made, uh, then you know that it's just a reflection of light. So this uh, might be an uh, indexical, indexical sign. Uh, but if you don't know how the photographic uh, camera works, then uh, you might start uh, making assumptions about uh, having strange uh, lights in your picture and make uh, symbolic uh, meanings out of it. I, I have actually problems acoustically to, to, uh, to understand it. Um, may I come just nearer so that I can also have a mask? And a, so <laughs> I'm sorry. I must, maybe you come here, or, okay. <laughs> so I will sum it up again. Uh, if, uh, if one knows how the photograph cam photographic camera works, um, then you can make a um, distinction between the idex indexical and the pictorial. And I gave the example of uh, the photographic flare, that if you know uh, how it functions, then uh, you know that it's just the light coming through diagonally from the lens, and you know it's just, uh, it's, just it's the impression of uh, this uh, array of light, and it's not something that you will interpret uh, um, symbolically, that uh, you have this uh, weird uh, light uh, disc of uh, something that uh, you don't know what it is and it might be a ghost or I don't know what. Uh, so this was a comment on uh, the difference uh, between uh, um, index and uh, picture in uh, photography, the medium of photography. These are created and produced then this uh, changes your attitude toward the picture. Yeah, the medium specifics of the picture yeah. Yeah, is important. Of course, I, I mean, of course, I mean, if we didn't know how photography is created, so if nobody had told us about those um, machines who do that, then, of course, we would have treated them like painting, mm. and we, we wouldn't make we wouldn't have um, made any difference. Mm. It's of course our knowledge about certain things in, in art history. Of course, I mean, we know a lot about art history, and that makes us able to interpret those pictures. So I, I would say that's highly important. Our knowledge is in general. I mean, we. We even we perceive the world according to our knowledge, 
and well anyway we, we perceive anyway on, only that what we want to perceive or what we uh, consider as important and so on so of course the way how we interpret photography is highly influenced by all our knowledge of that me medium you know, of course yeah but interestingly i mean although we the medium has changed as a medium in a certain sense um, change to a digital uh, format we, we know that we know that i guess almost all uh, photography is digital photography and that should be a little bit different because we can now manipulate everything it hasn't but it hasn't actually changed our attitude to photography I, I don't know one has to ask people has it changed it or I mean one should expect that if everybody knows that the causal relation if we assume that that was in in analog photography if that is any longer valid that this should change our attitude towards photography mm -hmm. this is really different uh, in the photography there is a saying that before photoshop we had stalin mm -hmm. you know the famous uh, story of the photo of stalin with one of his generals that he edited in some way okay. to cut him out from the picture okay history and uh, the memory Okay, yeah, that's of course true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we could uh, manipulate also uh, photography when, uh, even in the uh, beginnings. That's of course right. Yeah. In, uh, in cropping and uh, taking a stand, uh, right, right. Is, uh, already a way mm. of mediating uh, yeah. indexicality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, if I understand correctly, the point of your talk is that in this era of deep fakes and tampering manipulation with digital photography, which continues the fact that photography was always staged, that our attitude should change to it, that we should be more suspicious of it, uh, isn't, isn't there, I mean, this is the devil's art, you know, devil's advocate, but isn't there something that's lost if we start doubting every single image that we see that we can no longer have forensic proof uh, of what's going on in the world, uh, that we call into question every single image that is being presented as a kind of reality. Um, I mean, you can have it, of course, if you, for example, if you ask uh, the ones who produce or distribute photography that they really give you all the, uh, all the data and when it is produced and, and if you make the history of the photography and the cause, also the causal history is somehow transparent. I mean, there are, I don't know it, the name, but there's a guy in the US who, who tried to do it with, uh, there's an online, I once heard a talk, of, but I can't remember about the name and so. So there are actually some attempts to, to compensate for that. Yeah, but they're totally ineffective. It's been demonstrated that even when, say, President Trump tells a lie, and then somebody comes and corrects it afterwards, it's got a limited impact. Even when you demonstrate the chain, no? there's a limited impact um, on rectifying the falsehood uh, once it's gone out into the world. Uh, um, I think that's why I was pressing you on authenticity and having trust in institutions because, because if we 
because what you're describing is a certain chain of expertise, uh, but the public's not necessarily going to follow that whole chain of expertise, so you can no longer have um, communicate messages of public interest to the public in an effective way if, if somehow the public is doubting every single image that is being presented as somehow being tampered or part of an ideology. Well, I mean, very difficult question. I mean, in a certain sense, of course, you, you have to rely on, on something makes life very difficult if you question all the time everything. You, you can't do that. You, that's trust in a certain sense. And then you must decide who do you trust. And sometimes there are not that many people you, you should trust. I don't know, but difficult, yeah. Who, who can you trust nowadays? In, let's say in Corona uh, discussions, and, very, and people start to to get violent about that, I, and very difficult. I mean, I, I was just taking one step, saying, "Well, be aware of those things." No? After the Trump uh, stuff, which was really awful. I mean, people started to have uh, to to buy um, times, for example, to make them survive, and, and I think that's of course good. And so I trust certain. So I would uh, I would support certain newspapers, let's say, not everyone. But this is a question of trust, and of course, the, the, I would say this is a different. Uh, discussion now. This is more political discussion. And so how can I uh, support that the public sphere is still working in a certain sense, no? also financially? No? I, th I think for me it has to do with the our ability to kind of take images at face value. Um, that, that what we lose by second guessing but again, it's, it's, I'm playing devil's advocate. I agree with your, the point that you're making. Uh, I'm just looking at the balance or what gets lost if you tip too far one way. I think we've had examples of that with COVID, with Trump, with, uh, yeah. the press and the journalism to, to, to be not correct, no? so to be part of the establishment, to lie on wars and all that stuff. For example, Chomsky and, and Habermas, I mean, they were very critical on media and, and uh, of course, on those new means to make media more effective in this and more effective also in the ideological sense no, it's not if you have a photo that's not an argument no, it's just giving you an, an, an emotion no. is that a good thing to do i don't know so and the strange thing is that that totally turned around then there's one guy and uh, yeah doing very extraordinary nonsense stuff knowing probably that it's all lies but using it just as a political weapon bring everything uh, uh, disturbing everything and strangely now we are uh, very happy to have those media institutions the left people 10 years earlier were criticized. It's very, I mean, I, I'm also confused. It's very, everything is very strange. No? But because Trump is doing more, hopefully, but you never know, because he's over exaggerating that line, that doesn't mean that we should be happy 
what we had. I mean, I mean, so it, it's very, very confusing at the moment. I would say, um, and if you boil it down even a little bit more, I would say what is what my concern is just um, let's think about things critically. Huh? Just be able to to ask proper questions. I was thinking about Ste what Stefan said that uh, there is this danger that we can't trust an image, a picture, a photography anymore. And I, I, I was thinking that um, some years ago you could buy a chocolate and uh, you, you didn't know what this uh, piece of food uh, contained. But at some point it, made, it was made obligatory to write down uh, at, the, at the wrap the, the certain ingredients. So I was thinking, as a, I don't know, uh, that if uh, a photography is uh, made of ingredients, like who is the photographer, what means it was used, what time it was uh, in place it was taken, and many, more, uh, many more other ingredients. And this was obligatory, <laughs> I don't know, for some uh, photography to be valid. Perhaps there could be, because pictures circulate the world, orphans, you find them anywhere without uh, being sure how they were made, who made them. But if there were some uh, specific things that could make you understand each picture a little bit more with certain uh, values and ingredients, perhaps that would uh, help uh, trust a bit more of not trust some for Yeah, and right, right, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's like if you go to a store and you, you would like to have uh, vegetables without poison. I mean, there are means to do that. Um, and you have a, uh, a seal, is it the right proper word? To, you can put it on and you're saying, okay, that's Demeter or it's some company. And it's the same game. I mean, you, news is also some kind of uh, uh, an offer and you have to take some steps to make it more um, more valuable or more trustworthy. Uh, you, you can you can do something and you should do something. Uh, and, and I take it that you were just saying that. Uh. It's not a question. It's like a, a thought that uh, perhaps that would give more credibility take out some of the risk that trust in anything. Because if a picture was uh, had with, with it some information, certain information, it would have to its credibility, you know, being the Yeah. Well, I would think that would be a good idea. Yeah. I mean, how that can be done in practice, of course, then another question. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah.